beginning. All right, so perfect. So um, thank you. As Karen mentioned, I'm Alex Morgan. Uh, I was, at one time, a researcher in this community, and I went to PSB the first time back in 2003. Um, but I was involved in a lot of startups, um, and for the last nearly a decade, I've been working in venture capital, and I now head the healthcare and biotech investing practice at Coastal Ventures. So what does that mean? Um, we invest in a lot of brand names uh, on the side that are not in healthcare biotech, names that you may recognize, but we do everything from things like Impossible Foods and Impossible Bur Burger to investing in fusion, um, new ways of doing things like mundane things, like just bringing food to your house. But we are very active in healthcare and biotech. So we have over 100 companies. I've listed just a handful of them, some names you may recognize. But if you want to grab me afterwards and talk about any of these things, we do a lot of things in brain-machine interface. We have technologies for working on problems with prematurity, um, N of one therapeutic development. We have a company just focused on that. We have efforts in um, tissue engineering, digital health, all kinds of things. But that's not what I'm here to talk about today. Um, this is mostly a set of things which I think are very tactical if you are considering, as a researcher, thinking about being involved in starting a company. Now, of course, you know, in a short period of time, I can't tell you everything you need to know to build a $10 billion company by any means, but I at least can try to address some of the things which I think consistently I see academic researchers end up doing, which are maybe not always in the best interest of their goals. And the important thing that I would say is that Remember that the most interesting and successful companies usually violate some widely held received wisdom uh, prior to their success, right? Like they're doing something that everyone failed at, but there aren't violations of the of physical properties of the universe that are, that are causing failure. They just di it, things don't work until they do. And so remember that. If you really have a thought about what, why something you, you have new idea, new approach, will work on a very hard problem, then it may be worth doing even if people tell you that it can't be done. So, why might you want to start a company? Greed is a reason, right? You, sometimes people make money doing this. Um, but I don't think that's the best reason. So let's go back to, and there's plenty of examples of why you can be very mission driven. Let's go back a little bit in history, and many people may know the story of Semmelweis, right? He, this is a, along with Jon Snow and the, the water handle pump for cholera. This was a great example of found data, doing some data analysis, trying to figure out that there actually was an association between having physicians have not washing their hands, and poor outcomes with their patients. And he spent nearly two decades of his life, after he first made this discovery, trying to convince doctors to wash their hands. Now, surprisingly, no one listened to him, and he got more and more enraged that, that basically he thought physicians were killing people unnecessarily. He ended up being committed, including by his family and his wife, into a, a, what at the time was a lunatic asylum, and somewhat ironically and tragically, he died shortly after from an infection. A couple years later, Joseph Lister, Listerine was named after him, although he has no association with the company, published this idea of antiseptic surgery. He was saving all his patients from all the, the downsides of infection, but no one adopted it. It was a complex system involving sprayers of cabalic acid. You had to boil your instruments. It was very unwieldy. No one was adopting it. But a, but a decade later, an American named Robert Wood Johnson was sitting in the audience at the um, World's Fair and heard Lister give a talk. He thought, that's interesting. He went on to think, okay, how do I make this, this insight, this research, into a product and started to sell sterile dressings, sterilely prepared sutures, and that's the start of Johnson & Johnson. So in order to take this important research and actually provide benefit and save millions of lives from the downside of infection, someone actually had to make the step of developing a product that they could then scale and then have the ultimate impact of saving millions of lives. So if you have an insight and a discovery and you think it can save millions of lives, you might want to think about how you might translate that out into a company. So why might you not want to do this? Risk? Well, often in academia and healthcare, we think a lot about downside risk. So healthcare is a great example where you think a lot about, well, at the best, you know, we'll have a patient live a normal, healthy life, but at worst, we can actually have a catastrophic outcome and cause death. So that's a downside risk aversion mentality. In entrepreneurship, it actually inverts. You're looking at, instead, the question of, well, can I do something with significant uh, upside? An example, I suspect most people here aren't, for example, running a company that's saving a million lives a year. 
But if you start on a path and you try for three or four years, you may still not be running a company that's saving millions of lives a year. But if there's a finite chance you are, that may be a risk worth taking. So we can reject that and focus instead on what's the upside potential. So this is, again, just almost a, just a tautology. But in action towards a goal, for example, trying to save a million lives a year, you'll, we won't get there unless you try. OK, so supposing you want to analyze journey. This, what I'm going to outline a few things that will seem obvious. Team is essential, right? In order to achieve something very difficult, you need people working very hard with good skills and appropriate fit to purpose. But consistently, if I were to say academic researchers get something wrong, we have world-class researchers, world-class research, world-class idea, and they don't end up building a world-class team around it. Great teams can be very successful even without great science. Great science in the hands of not strong teams often don't succeed. And the company you build is the team you, you recruit, not the business plan you have. And this is shown again and again. And if, again, if, if anyone in the audience is listen, listening to me, it seems reasonable, and some people nod. Not many people are nodding now. But it, oftentimes, when you say something like this, people nod and say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Many people in academia that are spinning out companies don't actually act as if they believe this. Now, interesting thing is you may actually be a very successful entrepreneur and not know it. If you've got tenure and you're a faculty member, well, you were giving a startup package. That's your seed funding. And you basically went into an environment. So the university is effectively, in a lot of ways, like a shopping mall. You're given a little bit of square footage. You have to run a business. And whether you're successful or not is determined by things like are you able to pay your rent through indirects? And are you able to support your staff? And you've successfully built a business if you went through this. Now, that's something that I don't think a lot of academics really internalize. You're just like, oh, I've been a successful entrepreneur. If you're going and, and someone in your sphere is starting a company, typically the CEO is the most important hire you need to make. Now, there are other constructs possible. But typically, hiring trickles down. And if you want a world-class team, you often need someone with the capability of recruiting a world-class team. Lots of different questions about what makes a great CEO for your startup. But one of the simple ways to think about it is, is this someone that you would like to work for? for? Would, you like one of your, would you go out and, with a straight face, try to get one of your colleagues to work for this person? Because that's really what you need to try to do to build a world-class team, is you need someone that can consolidate that talent. Someone also needs to effectively be the definitive decision maker. Small companies need to move quickly. They can't spend a lot of time in debate. And you, it's really about the bringing someone, take, using with sort of force of will and energy, taking the future and dragging it into the present. And that takes a lot of exceptional drive and being very thoughtful. And as I said, other constructs are possible, but small companies can fail for lots of reasons. And smart academics and smart people will often think, well, I can try to, maybe this construct will work. It's possible. But you really typically want a very strong CEO to nucleate the company around. So sometimes academics and researchers, and forgive me, I know no, not everyone is an academic, but I think that's sort of the plural, plurality of the audience, think, oh, I just need to hire someone to handle the business. And oftentimes have a model of a business person not really that different from a used car salesman. And this is not what you need. You need someone very thoughtful and driven. So let's reject this. But I also want to talk for a second about some things that are not actually qualifying for being a successful startup CEO. Now, I'll also say these don't disqualify you, but they are not inherently by themselves sufficient. Your spouse, your in-laws, your children, if someone just happens to have an MBA. So MBAs are actually fairly orthogonal to, to guiding someone to be a startup CEO, frankly. There are some lot of valuable things you learn, but in most situations, it's actually not a qualifying event to be, to be a startup founder or not a successful one. Perhaps even worse is, oh, there's a business school kid around. Why don't I have them start my company? Now, they may be successful, but that not having gotten into a high, you know, a, a well-known business school is not sufficient to be sufficient sig uh, signal to be a startup CEO. A grad student or postdoc in the lab, that's not actually sufficient. It may be. Now, we have, I'll, I'll say that there are violations of all these things. So we have some great, highly successful husband and wife teams like NABLA. Um, the Collison brothers who started Stripe are a generational pair of entrepreneurs and actually are funding the ARC Institute. Uh, there are many grad students who are involved in developing technology, postdocs as well, that have gone to leadership positions in companies and been wildly successful. But the point I'm making is 
that it is not sufficient and it is very context dependent on the individual. And as I said, many people say, well, I have a personal relationship here, there's some trust. If you actually are trying to take your world-class science and your world-class idea, remember, you owe it to that to probably try to build a world-class team. There are a few things that are maybe less obvious. No, maybe obvious, like oh, maybe I put my in-laws in, um, this maybe is not always a great idea. There are a set of things that sometimes people think actually are qualifying, which th that I would say are actually less valuable or predictive of, in success of a startup than you may think. So there are lots of smart and great people that have come out of management consulting. There are lots of good people who have come out of being serial entrepreneurs, lots of people who have come out of big companies and have been successful and so forth, even venture capitalists. But that is not in any way necessarily predictive. And in fact, many of these things are actually predictive of not success. So success, especially if you work for years in things like management consulting, you work in a big company, even a big tech company, that is often more signal that you are very good at internal politics in large organizations, and often doing things like spending money, not creating value, like hiring consultants. Venture capital people often can have some, you know, can pitch well, they can do all kinds of things, they can raise money, but often end up being sort of armchair quarterbacks and not actually great at building startups. Doesn't mean these backgrounds can't do, uh, be successful, but they are not actually sufficient. And, you know, the other category I'd mention is the serial entrepreneur. So if you're potentially looking to work with someone and they're a serial entrepreneur, that may not be predictive of success because if they're consistently, because again, the risk model that I just mentioned, some people actually realize early on, it's like, well, I can just keep trying and maybe I'll, I'll hit it big. But if you've consistently tried and not returned money to investors, the company hasn't gone well, you're actually learning, you're actually getting revealed information about that person's ability to lead a big company. Now, lots of cases, people have tried a few times, companies have failed, and suddenly they've succeeded. So there's that. But just remember, the fact that someone's a serial entrepreneur or worked at McKinsey or has an MBA from a fancy school, those are not necessarily the features that you want to look for. And your, again, your business is very context dependent, what industry you're in, and so forth. So what if you don't have someone? Keep looking. It is very dangerous to just give up and, okay, my sister-in-law has an MBA, let her run the company. That's not the right answer typically. You can do it yourself, as I mentioned. You may be more entrepreneurial than you think. Or if you're trying to go out and raise money for something, you can go to investors with some clarity on this and say, I don't have a CEO. I have this idea. I'm a great scientist. Can you help me find someone? Now, you effectively pay for it because the investors will take a bigger chunk and they'll do other things. But ultimately, in most cases, the outcome ends up because these you know, successful companies here are power laws. And the very successful outcomes way outweigh the medium outcomes or failures. So the other last thing I would say on this topic is that make sure if you're getting going into business with a business person that it is a reversible process. So if you are a world-class scientist with a world-class idea, and you, you find someone, and you're like, well, maybe I'll give them a shot. You don't want to tie the success of your whole enterprise to a person who's untested if you don't really know if it's going to work out and find a way that you can back out of it. OK, so I intentionally talked about team before I talked about idea. So what makes a good idea? The first thing is, does it actually solve a problem for a large number of people? Cure for Alzheimer's, clear. It's going to help a lot of people. There are many things in research we do because they're actually interesting. We're curious about them, they're fun, that's fine, but to really be a successful company, you actually have to actually look out and help someone. Then you can start to think about other things, like how much does it cost to make or sell what I'm trying to do, how is it scale, and figuring out, trying to think about things like how much people might actually want to pay for this. Now, you don't actually have to have all this baked out in advance. For example, if you have a cure for Alzheimer's disease, probably the biggest question is not like, oh, exactly what price people are going to pay, but just how are you going to demonstrate that it works? So you don't over-index on these. But remember, anyone can have a company, but at some level, at some point to have a business, you actually have to start selling something, right? And it's usually, this is a thing that's always way harder than anyone actually, particularly in academia, thinks. And again, as a particular anecdote, where often very smart academics get tripped up is, for example, thinking that consumer sales is very easy, because they're like, oh, these idiots sell all this junk online. They're, it's, I can figure it out. It's much harder than you might think, typically. 
And the cost of sales actually affects everything. Why does so much in biomedicine healthcare cost so much? Actually, selling to doctors is very expensive, right? Pharma companies have to spend twice as much money on sales and marketing than they do on developing drugs. And that's not, it's not actually like just wasted in a lot, and sometimes it's wasted, and there's a lot of issues there. But sometimes it's just you need to educate the market, right? Customers don't necessarily know about your product until you spend money trying to educate them. And that's why Google, Meta, Twitter, all these things that, that digital advertising actually does work, but it is, does cost money. And so you have to factor that in to understand whether your product will work. And many good products that are beloved disappear. People don't really understand why, because they, well, it's, you know, didn't cost that much money to make. It's actually a cost of sales. All right. When you go forward, you may want to have a little bit of insight of the sales process and so forth. As I said, you don't have to know everything, but having some thoughts and at least starting to think about what sales will look like is helpful. Don't fall into the trap of asking people what they want if, rather than trying to figure out what problem they actually have, right? This is the Henry Ford, what do you want? I want a faster horse. You will actually want a totally different thing if you really understand what people's problems are and you're developing a product to address them. Um, remember, all major innovations come outside from outside their industry and domain experts are always experts in the past, not in the future. But you have to, you should still need to understand what problems you're solving, what the motivations, what the actual process that it would be for someone to allocate resources towards your product or service. The other thing to think about is asymmetric upside and scaling properties. General public, if you look at politi political, political rhetoric, everyone thinks about things as a zero-sum game. Even most business people think in very linear ways. And I get MBAs, again, talking about, I don't mean to be bad, say anything negative, it's not a bad thing, but lots of people come and point to an exponential curve and they'll say, look at the inflection point that's going to happen. And I say, well, there's no inflection point. It's exponentials all the way down the derivative chain. And they, what are you talking about? They don't think about things in anything other than effective linear method, models, and they don't really have any intuition about calculus. Hopefully this audience is full of people that are interested in computer science will know what I mean when I say, have big O thinking. Think about the scaling properties. And there are questions like, does your thing, does your process, does your company scale with labor? That's actually hard, that's a hard way to scale. This is one of the challenges in healthcare. Everything tries to, we try, you know, historically have tried to scale with labor. Does it scale with a fixed, fixed commodity like real estate or oil? You can address it, but it's a hard way to scale. Can you do, does your company, is a manufacturing a product? Well, actually, you see with things like cell phones, at some level of scale, you can really drive the price down. So it's hard, but you can actually scale effectively if it's through advances in manufacturing and basically economies of scale. But if you scale with software, that has great scaling properties. And then even better, if there are network effects or power laws inherent, your product gets better with use, that has an amazing scaling property. I'll give an example of a common thing that people from sort of the computational biotype community often come and pitch a, a story something like this. Give me $100 million, I'll sequence a bunch of people, and I'll have biological insights that'll be super valuable. And like, that may be true. And there are a lot of companies actually are homomorphic to that in some way. They're in proteomics or special subtype of patients or whatever. Well, if you actually think about it in your big O notation, if you're doing something like sequencing people, that's usually fairly linear in spend. Like each person costs X amount of money to sequence and there are some economies of scale but you kind of lose that because your additional operating cost to actually scale something. So it basically is linear. Now if you're trying to use that to generate data to create value, what's the value of data in a machine learning system or just any kind of learning system? It's approximately logarithmic in value, something like that. And so those are actually divergent functions. What, if you're spending more than the value you're creating, at some point those break. Now, it doesn't mean this is inherently a bad idea, especially if you're over on the far left-hand side. You can still be generating a lot of value while you're spending linearly for your process, but think about the scaling properties of your business, because if you actually want to break through, this kind of thinking is what needs to guide a lot of your resource allocation decisions. Then there are things like, there people go back and forth and say, oh, it's a platform, but people don't like to hear about platforms, or everyone wants to be a platform, people like platforms. It's more a question of to thine own self be true. Is your thing actually a reproducible system that can generate units of value consistently again and again? And that's very platformy. If it can't really, and it's you know, maybe an approach to a universe or approach to thinking, then it's not really platformy, but you have to be realistic about what it is. Now, I guess at all, for this part, talking about the, what makes a good idea, which again, I'm very vague about, 
remind everyone that you actually don't need to have a good idea. You often, as a person, and you want to allocate your resources and time behind something, you can go and try to find good ideas in the world. And it's often success is the critical mass of talent coming together to change the world. So you don't have to, it doesn't have to be your idea, you just have to recognize a good team and a good idea and join up with them. And I, the other caveat I would say is for a lot of academics, they often say, well, I'll advise a company and blah, blah, blah. One thing to keep in mind is it's very hard to continuously add value to a company that's actually succeeding. Like at the very start, there are two or three people, one day a week you can add a tremendous amount of value as a domain expert. If the company starts to succeed, there are a bunch of specialized experts that are full-time working there, and very quickly coming in for half day a week, it's very hard to contribute value. And it, that's something to, for as you plan potentially working with the company, something to think about. All right, let's get into fundraising, because this is what often what people want to talk to me about. Fundraising does not equal success. Many examples out there in the world of companies high profile rate a bunch of money. Now, as an entrepreneur, people often want to point to companies that are in the news and raise a bunch of money as examples of success. That's not the right way to think about it. It's about a Goldilocks principle. The goal really is to raise just what you need to try to create value, right? The goal is to generate more value than money you took in. Right? And success, that's the metric of success. Now, I love 23andMe, lots of people that, actually some BMI colleagues actually were involved in, in getting that off the ground. Wonderful things, very smart people. I, a lot of people come to me and they talk, they'll point to a company X and say, Are, we're, we're building a company just like X. I say, is that a good company? And they say, yeah, it's in the news, raise a bunch of money, it has this valuation, whatever. That's actually not really the metric as it, if you go to an investor, what they're thinking about. So, 2006 to 2020, they rose about 850 million. It's actually a long time to stay private, and that has a lot of issues for early employees, which we'll talk about in a second. The company went public and SPAC when a lot of that activity was going on, raised roughly another $800 million. And you can look, I think today it's about a $450 million market cap company. And that's actually you know, good, it's a valuable company, smart people, they're generating value. But if you look at it through the lens of an investor and the various earliest employees, how do you get equity value creation if you, now your actual net value at the end of the day is less than the total money invested. And that is true for lots of high profile companies that people point to. So I made this slide pink. Now these aren't slides aren't have great graphics, so whatever, I apologize for that. Um, I made this slide to stand out because statistically most of you won't start companies, but you'll probably think about working with companies, join a company, advise students who are thinking about joining companies, and consistently I would say surprisingly very smart academics get this wrong all over the place. Now, in academia, it is usually, all other things being equal, better to join a lab that is extremely well found, found, funded than a lab that isn't well funded. Now, in a very big lab with a lot of money, maybe you get less PI supervision if you're a grad student or postdoc, but if you're self-sufficient, it's probably fine and it's better to go with, go with one that have a lot of resources. In the business world, particularly in startups, I would contend that that's actually very often the opposite way that you should think about it. If you're an employee, if you're joining as an employee, you get options, which are at a price, and you want, to, you want them to increase in value so you can sell them at some point and exit at a higher price. So the valuation of the company you join, the lower it is, actually, the better it is for you. So there's, and this gets into details, it probably doesn't matter, but there's actually a 4 or 9 valuation and strike price and all these things for tax purposes doesn't matter. The point is, if a company raises a lot of money, it's very hard for the valuation to be low. Just basically is. So let's talk through a couple examples. High profile company, you hear about in the news, they start right out of the gate raise $500 million. Well, for all this stuff to work, basically the company needs to double in value every couple of years. So two or three years, that company basically needs to be worth Five billion. So raise 500 million in a couple of years, be worth five billion. That is very hard to do, both because it's hard to be a five billion dollar company in a couple of years, and it's also hard to spend 500 million dollars efficiently. And if you take in five million dollars, usually they have a plan for spending that money pretty aggressively. Then, if you're down that path, you raise 500 million dollars, you're spending 500 million dollars over three years. You typically then need to take in another 500 million dollars to keep going. Right? The train needs to go, and you've hired a bunch of people, and there's a lot of stuff happening. The number of people that then come up with another 500 million to keep that thing going is a small set of the universe. And it actually can be more risky than people realize to join a well-funded company because a very well-funded company typically also has a very high burn rate, which is why some of the companies, you saw, things I listed on the previous thing, flame out in very high-profile ways. 
Take a different context. There's a company, a couple people work there. They raise $5 million. Maybe it's five to 10 people. Okay, they can generate a lot of value. Maybe in a couple years, may I have that company worth $50 million, $100 million. Then, if it's, it has nice scaling properties, the way I've mentioned, they've often figured out something, and actually that company can then be a $5 billion company. And that's great for the early employees because the value has increased tremendously. If it's also a medium outcome, so five to 10 people take in $5 million, they work on summary truth years, they exit that company and they sell it for $50 million, $100 million, they actually can make, probably for many of you who are grad students or academics, actually take in their pocket a decent amount of money, whereas if a company raises $500 million out of the gate, if it doesn't in a couple years reach evaluations of several billion, early employees may effectively make very little from their options. And you may have experience with this. You have friends or colleagues, for example, that joined a high-profile company that raised a bunch of money. Even if things go well at that company, a couple years, they're still working, they have a different job, they made maybe more money than you because they're in industry, not academia. You may have another friend or colleague that went and joined something you've never heard of, and then three or four later, suddenly they're retired. This is what happened. Okay, so let's say you need, and by the way, I'm not saying you shouldn't join a company that's raised a lot of money, because you make the team maybe one that you want to work with, the mission may be important, and it may turn out to be a $10, $50 billion company. And there are lots of cases where that's, that's true, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a great thing for you to do economically, and it, just because it raised a lot of money is all I mean to say. Okay, so let's say you're actually trying to go to someone like me and raise money. First thing is know your audience. Think, know, learn something about investors. Think of, and I, actually uh, the point is, what does it take to be a venture capital investor? Access to dollars and nothing else. So one of the things to keep in mind is most venture capitalists are not actually good at their job. And this is not just a half of all people are below average. It is a power loss distribution, and there are a handful of individuals and groups that actually are super successful, and most everyone else it turns out to not be successful. Now, they often train, there's a lot of external dynamics. For example, up generally when the market's going in a positive direction, a lot of people raises all boats, but then when things crash, suddenly it's kind of people, the reveal, there's revelation about who's actually doing a good job and who isn't. It has a very high turnover rate. Keep that in mind as you go. Think about who you're partnering with. This is, you know, in some ways it's good because people can give you high valuations and throw money around when there's money in the, in the market. Um, it's bad because you can end up partnering yourself with someone that can really negatively affect your business. Just, it's just a fact. Now, I'll try to go fast through this. This is a little bit of like Alex's typology of investors because not, not all investors are like random finance people, right? Now, you can have a, bo what, I'll, what I'm calling a Boston investor, you can have a Boston style investor in Tel Aviv or in you know, South Carolina, but these are kind of my tribal groups of investors. Boston inv investors are kind of biotech focused, New York are private equity type of people, um, Silicon Valley are tech VCs, kind of the, the, you watch the show Silicon Valley, those kind of VCs, they're strategic. So like big companies like Pfizer and um, IBM, whatever, they actually have venture arms, right? So that's a whole different tribe. And then they're just people that, rich people that have money. They could have inherited money from a publishing business or textiles or oil, or they made their own money through their whatever. Um, how do you recognize them? Because it's not always obvious. If you have a kind of like gray-haired PhD that did some pharma stuff, an investor, they're probably a Boston style. If they're a finance bro and they look at spreadsheets, probably a private equity kind of culture. If they're a person that comes from tech startups, either in the commercialization or the engineering side, they may be a Silicon Valley style. If, they're, if they spent 20 years working in pharma and now in VC, they may be a strategic, a lot of actually strategic venture groups aren't named for the strategic venture they represent, which is a little bit confusing. Um, and then angel fair in office, if you have a very successful entrepreneur that's investing their own money, it's kind of obvious. Or if you have an heir to a fortune and their friends are deploying money, that's often a sign. So how do you bait these different groups of people? Well, Boston, the Boston tribe loves academic IP, a famous scientific founder, um, and they want to know, they often typically want to force you to follow a very specific playbook. New York people are very focused on near-term return rates, EBITDA, they want to only be in known markets. Silicon Valley types like a promising story, an interesting set of founders. Strategic, they actually will often invest in areas, companies that will potentially disrupt the mothership and sometimes even try to quash you if you start to succeed. Just keep that in mind. Um, 
strategic VC often ends up being guided by the C-suite of their organization. So take an organization, you know, big company, Pfizer, they have a C-suite that decides the strategic vision of where they want to do for information, and they send a little venture team to make little bets on that strategic vision. Angel and family offices do all kinds of wild stuff. It's like the Wild West, because it's like people spending their own money in interesting ways. What are the weaknesses? So Boston Tribe really wants to control your business, the undervalued team, they only care about the assets, so that's how they structure and finance companies. New York, they only care about incremental financial returns you know, in the near term. Um, Silicon Valley, they actually have this very different principle where they're trying to return the whole fund and they can't reallocate capital over a time period, so they're really trying to drive for the big win. They're trying to drive you to be a $5 billion company. If that's not the journey you're on, you maybe don't want to partner with that group. Strategic, they have all kinds of weird mixed incentives, which you should be aware of, including potentially investing in your company with the eye to try to buy it at a bargain as soon as it looks like it's working. And you should be aware of what that means and think about it. Angel family offices often have all kinds of different things. One of the things to be aware of, though, is if they have a special interest in an area, they will often over-index on price and deploy too much capital. And when you go out and try to raise from market of professional investors, it actually is a mismatch of how they've priced your company and how much money they put into it because they've invested for personal reasons. Now, I have a little time left, so this is the decision-making process, particularly on the investor side. One of the things that you want to think about, in general, if you're doing any kind of enterprise sales process and trying to sell equity in your company to an investor is a kind of enterprise sales process, is you want to do your customer's job for them. And that is for an investor side, help them prepare, guide them to create the investment memo that will get your company funded. And you can actually Google for what investment memos look like, and in various lawsuits, they've actually been made public. Uh, Roloff Bartha's um, investment memo about YouTube is super interesting to read in retrospect, and it's available, but it's the kind of artifact that investors are actually putting together for you. And it kind of has all these kind of questions in it. But uh, the thing that I'd really encourage everyone to do if they think about starting a company is be incredibly realistic. Now, you have to have some naivete or you wouldn't try to do some of these impossible things. But for example, I'll just highlight one thing. Being, uh, I mentioned team. Being very realistic about who you have involved because if you go and say, no one, no, no one says anything typically other than, I have an amazing team, right? That's okay, what does that mean? Well. If you have brought in all your friends, gave them C-level titles, and your buddy who can kind of program is the CTO, that is not a signal that you're gonna build a world-class engineering organization. It isn't. And if you, but if you're realistic and you say, well, this person in my team is really good at this, but at some point I'm gonna need someone that can do this, I have a head of this that needs to do that, those are all really important considerations that you need to have, and you wanna be very realistic with investors. So, Remember, investors are people, they have their own personal motivations, so if you're trying to sell them, you have to think about what those are. And I will then I talk about intellectual property. The main thing to remember is that your tech transfer office is not your company's interest. And how they think about creating patents, and I was in Stanford writing patents in my disclosure form, that is not how you want to think about it around the company. Full stop, completely different way of thinking, different kinds of patents, different kinds of thinking. I'll end with, this is actually a fantastic time. Down markets, talent gets consolidated. This is when the next generation big companies get developed. We've heard a lot of talks about new innovations in science, right? Things are changing in dramatic ways. This is a great time to ride that wave of innovation. And if you want to contact me, we have some resources for entrepreneurs. You can email me, find me on Blue Sky, actually, find me on Twitter, and these are some great books. So I, Marilyn's trying to get, uh, pull me off stage with a hook, but I'll be around. If you want to talk to me about anything, let me know.